Welcome to the Maritime Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Wioli. In each episode, we bring you exclusive interviews with maritime professionals, industry experts, and students. Our guests come from different backgrounds, including shipping, yachting, offshore, and more. Our goal is to give you all the knowledge you need to succeed in the maritime industry. Welcome everyone, welcome back to a new podcast episode. We are with William, shipbroker with more than six years uh, of experience in, the, in this field. This uh, episode serves as an introduction of shipbroking and will be a real masterclass for those who want to know more about the world of shipbroking. Uh, hello William, it's a pleasure to having you uh, today in this uh, podcast episode. Can you introduce yourself and talk about your background please? Yeah, uh, hey Paul, it's, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, an happy Saturday. It's uh, it's been a bit of a, in a bucket list uh, uh, item of mine this podcast. So thanks for reaching out. Uh, I have been, as you mentioned, in uh, in shipbroking for a little over six years. I studied both finance and uh, shipping, maritime business, two years in England. I currently live in uh, in Oslo where I've been working for the past six years. I did a two-year stint in the UK um, studying maritime business at the, the Solid University of Southampton. And uh, we have every semester there was this maritime week, right? Mm. It was uh, a maritime week where we had, you know, guest speakers with different backgrounds coming from different parts of the sector, all, sectors, uh, you know, all from tech to finance and everything in between, you know, logistics, management, container, gas, and finance, everything. And uh, <clears throat> Clarkson's actually, or <laughs> there was a Clarkson's guy, uh, a HR guy who came and had a talk about what we're talking about right now, right? How, how to get your foot in the door and, you know, what it's like. And, and, he, and we had this competition <laughs> or he announced this competition that was you have to write you have to write this text about the future of shipbroking what shipbroking what what you think shipbroking is about and uh, everyone submitted or i don't know how many but to me it felt like everyone was kind of like maybe 100 maybe 200 people uh because the prize was uh an internship in uh, Clarkson's which was I think a summer like three four months where you rotate on the desks it was quite you know a fantastic program for for youngsters right and I actually won it I didn't even know what shipbroking was in practice but uh, I was kind of lucky I guess uh, but uh, yeah I, I won the prize and I was offered a six month uh, rotation desk rotation in Clarkson's London uh, office it's such a nice uh, story I mean uh, because Clarkson yeah, it's uh... It's very competitive, I imagine, in, in the UK. Yeah. All students want to may, to start internship with this company because this is, uh, I think, the number one in shipbroking. Uh, but it's still interesting that we we have many op opportunities in this industry, especially in shipbroking. I want to ask you now: uh, Can you define what is a shipbroker on the world of shipbroking? Can you make like five minutes? Or a kind, it's an exercise, huh? <laughs> a kind of introduction of uh, this field. Yeah, uh, I might start. I don't know if I mentioned I work in dry bulk and uh, dry bulk only. I tried to dabble with some chemicals, uh, with some dry bulk clients, but never really panned out. But uh, but yeah, the, um, you know, in just layman's terms, it's procurement of cargo for ships and securing a carrier for cargos, basically. Okay. Uh, that and. You know, in in this respect, there is uh, there is a huge difference between uh, how you do it, um, because uh, it's it's uh, you do it on a voyage basis or a TC basis, which means you do it on voyage means you do it on per ton basis. This is a different way of working uh, when you uh, approach the ships, because then you're doing it on behalf of a cargo. And if you're doing it on TC, which means time charter, which means you're basically renting a ship per day, mm. you're often you're often doing it on behalf of an owner. So it's a little bit of a different way of uh, doing things. But you know, it's uh, I would say it's uh, it's basically you're a middleman, a facilitator, and the next step is you're a 
uh, you're a counselor, a conciliator uh, to one of the parties, uh, and on the deepest, you know, the deepest level, uh, as a ship broker, you basically you get someone who's not doing freight to do freight. That's when you like get into it. How you really yeah. make someone, for example, if you get a if you get an industrial client, say for example, do you ha- do you have any uh, do you have any local industry? If you're a broker, you think do you have any local industrial giants that's you know you you know are moving cargos but are not doing the freight? They are selling the product to a trader who is handling mm-hmm. the shipping part of it. Then you approach them and say, you know, I know all the terms, I know all the players. Uh, let me help you control the freight aspect yourself, which mm-hmm. is in many ways more complicated but it can in the long run save you money and uh, it's it, that so there are three stages you're either a middleman a counselor and then you are you know the one that actually facilitates someone to do the shipping part themselves you're brokering the ship for them the shipping you're a, you're a link to the industry basically okay. and, and what you do is you make two parties that have highly contradictory interests meet have a meeting of the minds you know um, uh, because the, uh, as a broker, you have two principles. You have both the owner and the charter, and um, the charter are the cargo interest. The owner owns the steel or controls uh, the, the steel, and um, and uh, you know they want to protect their interests. You know, they're, everyone's in it to make money or in cargo. Uh, well, in the on the cargo side to save money. Uh, and uh, you know, I've had many scream at me in frustration. Uh, you know, if you walk away from a deal where, where the deal is done, but when no one is happy, everyone got the best deal possible. You know, okay. uh, so you negotiate both, um, you know, money and uh, legal clauses. And I have, I don't have, don't have any legal background, even though my mother and my sister have studied law. I have not. But uh, but then also it's uh, you you're a, you're a man of many hats basically you have to okay. represent um, you have to represent an owner a charter uh, find a silver lining or a middle ground and um, and also know a lot about a lot but you know it's different so you don't you know it you know a little bit about a lot but not okay not, you don't know. Very I know well, what you mean. You but can, can yeah. you provide a, like an example, for example, a practical example? For example, you have the cargo owner; he wants to ship the on board the ship, so you are you you need to to find the the space on board. So can you try to make it like very, how can I say, uh, concrete, practical? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's use an example that's uh, that happened to me just today. It's Saturday. I wake. I wake up, and uh, you know it's twenty-four hour, twenty-four hour, seven day a week, no holidays, kind of business, right? <laughs> Lifestyle, as yeah. the old guys say. And you now I wake up this morning. I got a. I got a WhatsApp message from one of my clients saying, "I have this and this cargo uh, going from A to B. Uh, if, let's say from uh, East Med to Brazil, for example. I have twenty thousand tons, thirty thousand tons, in owner's option." <laughs> How much they can want to carry, and this is a voyage cargo. They they get paid how much they carry. They get paid per ton, basically. So um, so I get this, and of course, no one is really working in the weekends. It's kind of the business is shut down, basically. I don't call around the owners on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, but uh, on Monday, or I drop a couple of messages maybe today. But on Monday, I do the rounds, and they say, okay, I might have a ship, and or I checked the tonnage list, you know, because we use tools. I guess we'll get to that later. Uh, and then I see ships in position. If it's super forward, the ships aren't in the market yet, for example. Then I call around, and that's when the relationship comes into the comes into the picture. And uh, and yeah, they tell me, you know, okay, I want this amount of money per metric ton, but I can't make dates, I want different dates, and we might not have a charter party already done, which means, okay, there's a lot more negotiation that's going to happen. If you have a charter party already done, you know, it's simple, you know, it's like tankers, you just negotiate uh, yeah. the merge uh, per metric ton, uh, you know, freight, and you're basically done, right? But, uh, 
you know so that's that's kind of how it goes it's quite exhilarating but yeah okay very interesting um yeah. so i know that uh, we have like two so you have the time charter uh, on the voyage charter um I, i think if we want to go deeper it's like time charter it's like you you book the vessel for a period of time you you can it's kind of renting the vessel to make it like practical on the voyage charter it's like a point uh, a to point b Uh, yeah. Okay, so these things at least is clear. Uh, I want to ask you this question. You, in shipbroking, we have SNP on chartering. Uh, can you elaborate on it? Because people say uh, they're always confused. They no, don't know uh, like the difference between both and why a shipbroker doing both. Or, or do you need to specialize how it works? I have never done SNP. I, I said next to an SNP guy in my old uh, office, but. Uh, The only way I guess you can bind it if you have a long if you have a guy doing SMP and he also flips out the ship on long period, that's basically it. Yeah. I've never even you know been close to You're doing chartering. Yeah, Maybe. yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had one of the senior guys in my old office. He was uh, he was you know referring. Yeah, so I think I have a buyer for the ship, and then they. But they don't know anything about SMP, so they call okay. SMP broker and then they get a maybe a referral fee if the deal, happen, deal happens. But okay, nah, not really. Um, you mentioned uh, previously, uh, so you have a customer call you to to you know to send the, the the cargo somewhere, and you need to find the ship. But do you need when you sometimes you don't know the ship, you don't know the ship owner. So is it your goal just to like cold calling say uh, hello? Uh, Is it possible to book your ship, or you you still have a database on? You, you... Yeah, well, that's kind of yeah. The, the thing is, that's way. That's why you know I'm I'm very lucky to have come into uh, broking houses that have a great network. It's like mm. when I call an owner, they know who we are. It's like there's basically no unchartered owners. Um, maybe they they don't know me personally. Because I follow the clients now, I I follow you know I I follow the clients where they have cargoes, and I might not I might never have loaded the cargo out of South Africa, for example. But mm. all everyone knows the company, so I call them, and they it's all you know it's as long as we have them in our database. But sometimes you know we see a ship that's a we see from another broker perhaps, and we can search for the ship and try to do detective work, <laughs> try to find mm -hmm. out who the owner is, so we don't have to. Work with another broker on this. So we can do it ourselves, but uh, but yeah, no, it's it's mostly in our database. I guess if you're new, if now if you come right out of school and you try to set up a broking shop, you're gonna be you're gonna you're gonna have to do all that legwork yourself. Right? Okay, it's a bit, uh, but yeah, no, basically all the A1 top-notch owners we are in contact with. Okay, very interesting. On the we know that we have like two kind of. Uh, Can I say kind of company? We have the in-house brokerage and the competitive brokerage. Is it true? Or? Yeah, I would say you know in my previous uh, gig I was working uh, more competitive stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I was working. I was a TC broker basically, uh, and there are different. Uh, you know you can do both, but usually you have a TC broker and a voyage broker or a cargo broker. Um, and uh, I was a TC broker when I first started. And I was working in a specific area because it's so mm. competitive that they have to specialize on an area. So I picked an area that wasn't covered by my desk. We were just a small team, and um, and uh, and it, yes, a lot more competitive because even though you don't have any business to propose, you just call around, build a relationship, make them. You have to stay top mind, top of the mind for them. So you know it's it's a lot more competitive now. I work more on a. I don't want to undermine anyone, but I feel like it's more. Uh, I feel it is more you you more service uh, clients uh, because I work on the voyage now, which means I have maybe well I'm I have clients that no shipping, but maybe some of my colleagues they are they are working with industrial guys that shipping is just a super small part of their business. You know mm. we have they outsource it basically to us. They trust that we have the competence to uh, act in their best interest. And stuff like that. So, uh, so it's less competitive in that way, even sometimes exclusive. So, uh, it's it's a totally different way of working because you don't just call around just to, you know, uh, just to just to have a talk, just to stay relevant. I, uh, you know, I've I've heard about some brokers on the TC just having a sheet of owners they call, 
in the competitive on the super competitive stuff uh, or or charters or operators they call and you just go down the list every morning call them and then when they're done start again oh wow and then they just <laughs> yeah so just keep do you have something now do you have something now because okay. they when they are first when on the competitive stuff you need to be first right if you go to the toilet you might lose out on a on a commission so it's like but uh, that's where the relationship comes into the picture, right? Because when you are, when you have a relationship, they will not, you, you, will, you won't lose out because you go to the toilet or stuff like that. It's just, but okay. that, that, that's just, uh, that's a very simplification, but it was an example. Yeah, yeah that's good. It's, uh, easy, yeah. easy to understand. And uh, what yeah. about the tasks as a Shibokar? What kind of daily task you need? Even if I'm sure it's not the same every day, but the mainly, you uh, well, it's uh, well as I said, it's uh, it's procuring it's uh, procuring cargo for ships and securing a carrier for the cargos. Uh, it's uh, the daily tasks is you know following up on the market. It's uh, maintaining relationships. No matter how competitive, you always gotta maintain relationship because even if you're working with super competitive TC stuff or you're working on exclusive stuff. The relationship you have with the owners is always super important, right? Yeah. So the daily tasks is basically just staying on top of the market and uh, yeah, fix a lot of shifts, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> wow, interesting, very interesting. <laughs> and um, yeah. we know that you have different kind of um, type specialization, as you mentioned. We need to specialize. Uh, so you have a dry bulk tanker. Can you, what is the main difference? Is it for you, you are dry bulk? What is the difference in your specialization? I'm not super familiar with different types, you know, but I shared a desk with a tanker broker at my last uh, my last gig. And, you know, he was this, uh, it was this textbook ship broker, he was Silver Fox, you oh. know, he was a sil and Silver Tongue as well. He was just, uh, you know, so he's a textbook tanker broker. And he was just a legend on the desk. And, uh, you know, but the thing is, they, um, uh, they work a little bit differently. They obviously they call around owners as well. They uh, make position lists uh, a little more than we do. We don't really do that. But uh, and th but the thing is, oil is so or or crude. They were in crude. It's very standardized, right? So there's very little to negotiate on. Mm. All the terms are already predetermined by international law and stuff like that. So it's it's quite set in stone much of it. So they they, they negotiate on. Uh, like four or three different points is world scale uh, freight and and the merge um, I'm not so uh, containers for example I have no relationship with I think that's very standardized these days but I don't want to yeah. I don't want to say anything wrong because I'm, I don't really know anything about it but uh, those who are still in it are quite big and doing great I think but they squeeze out all the small ones because it's highly tech driven at this point right mm. Merge is still huge have in house brokers and uh, uh, I I have a couple of friends in gas and offshore and and uh, chemicals even and seems super interesting it's sharp elbows same as every broker shop and every every broker every sector in brokering I mean uh, so but I can't really speak to the yeah. to the exact differences uh, sorry but uh, but you yeah, know it's uh, it's all in the in the end I think it's all kind of the same like okay. if you boil it down to the yeah so yeah. so you for you so the dry bulk um i imagine you need to follow the market very closely because uh for example with the events we have right now uh it has an impact on your job i imagine yeah it's like the, it's, in every sector it's the cheapest ship that decides the market because oh. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the market is what the last fixture is basically and even though if uh, owners uh, who says that was fixed too cheap they say uh, oh no that doesn't count it was some they needed to go to dry dock or whatever well okay they fixed uh, this level that then this is the market now and that's why it's so important to be on top of what is being done what fixtures uh, it's so the market is super liquid. I believe an um, an economist described the shipping market and and another market I can't recall which. The shipping market has like the perfect, uh, the perfect uh, like the perfect market because it's super transparent. Everyone speaks to everyone, and there's no hidden. Obviously now we have the uh, shadow fleet with Russia and we've had it with Venezuela and Iran to some extent, but 
uh, even North Korea, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, you know, it's it's all super transparent. You know, I see fixtures now. We have a two two tier market, for example. We see um, uh, now when we report, uh, sh uh, you know, a fixture from from the continent or Baltic area, we say this was a Russian loader because you, see, you don't even need to mention it because it's always a double the yeah. double the price. <laughs> so yeah, it's, imagine. Uh, yeah. So it's, okay. uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's important to be on top of it, I guess. Okay, okay. And do you have an anecdote to share about uh, your your journey as ship broker, or even in the maritime industry? Uh, well, 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 uh, you know, going back to what I said about the relationships, for example, uh, I don't know if this is a. Uh, Cancel an anecdote, but or more like brain. But uh, okay. <laughs> I was I was uh, I was on a boys trip to Ireland, uh, like celebrating New Year's Eve. You know, we do this every year uh, with the lads, and um, and uh, and uh, on, on New Year's Eve, I get a message from you know my owner, my my super close owner. We were good friends. He was actually a reference when I was job searching. So we were close. He was a great guy. And uh, and on uh, on New Year's Eve, he sent me a message like, "Hey, you're on subs." <laughs> with uh, this and this, uh, from it was US Golf to India. It's good paying business, you know, for a trip out of the Atlantic, it's, it's always high high rates. And uh, and I'm like, oh, what? Are you, <laughs> what is this? And he goes, yeah, congratulations. We're uh, we're on subs until January second or whatever. And uh, when you're on subs, um, might mention this. Uh, when you conclude a deal, uh, when you con when you start the parties done negotiated basically or when the main terms are negotiated you go on uh, uh, subjects which is a, f a 24 hour clock uh, Sundays, holidays and Saturdays excluded uh, which means that the vessel is in for vetting in both load port and discharge port or you know all the ports involved uh, so you have 24 hours to reconfirm uh, the business basically and okay. You know this, uh, <clears throat> and this time, you know, it's obviously used to do the charter party points because owners have a charter party that's connected with the ship, so you do those points. But and you and, and back in the day, you know, rumor has it that back in the day, this 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 uh, time was purely technical. It was only for technical approval. But some traders, you know, uh, just figure out, okay, we might actually use those 24 hours to our advantage. If the market falls, we can find something cheaper, we can let go of the ship. And then now it became kind of like, now it also became if the market drops in that time, we might find something else. So that has happened to me a couple of times just because the market dropped in 24 hours. It says a little bit oh. how volatile the market can be, which is oh. what happened on January 2nd. <laughs> The market had tanked uh, just because Q1 is always pretty weak in my sector, uh, and the ship was released. So, but it was an anecdote, nonetheless. So, wow, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Such a big one. Yeah, that was pretty so, sad. Sad start to the year, I can tell you. Yeah, that. but <laughs> I mean, even now the market is crazy, you know. It, it it is quite. It is it is quite firm. It is it is quite firm. It was it was super firm. Like in the wake of Corona, you know, oh. right after it just tanked, and yeah. then you know it took off. It, like it went parabolic. It was absolutely insane because you know these ships got tied up in port for um, for uh, for what do you call it quarantine. It's been so long since Corona. I forgot the quarantine word. Okay. I, uh, I, I like because it, you have to wait two weeks between uh, the loading port and discharge port, and mm -hmm. obviously if you do the long hauls, then that wouldn't the the, the 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 fourteen days at sea. You know you don't need to wait fourteen days in a port then, but a lot of those quick trips, uh, you know, tied up a lot of tonnage, which gave a squeeze in the market, and obviously cheap interest interest rates kind of fueled it facilitated a lot of traders to you know move cargos because when you have low interest rates obviously uh, when money is cheap you can easily do a deal uh, so it uh, it went parabolic I must say, I must say. actually at wow. the top of the market I did a cargo that was trading you had to follow icebreaker open the Baltic it was December 2001 
and that was the the highest fixture I've ever done. It was because obviously you have ice, you have the market high, and this was a, a trip out of the Atlantic to India uh, with fertilizer. I had the time chart equivalent uh, on that. It was a voyage cargo. It was sixty-seven thousand dollars a day on a sixty-three thousand tonner. And for reference, now it's like. 20 maybe Oof, and on wow. the on the bottom earlier this year it was like 10 so so yeah it was quite it was quite uh, it was quite firm it was mm, but this sure. is something that happens like maybe three four times in a lifetime of a broker i think so it's okay but yeah. you you uh, you add this uh, encounter this experience nice um yeah. what uh, about collaboration with um, other players in the industry because as a shoe broker you maybe you work with the charter uh, chartering team on the um, it can be have of course the ship owner what is the who are your i can say uh, colleague yeah yeah, no, I, I can't mention any names, but it's a mutual bene mutually beneficial relationship. You know, charters depend on my link into the shipping industry, my relationship with owners, and owners depend on my link to the cargo client, my relationship with the charters. And I work now, you know, earlier in my last gig, I was working uh, primarily with, uh, uh, with the operators and the owners uh, doing TC because operators, they book in voyage cargos from the industrial guys. Uh, the traders and then they play the market you know because they might think the market is going down they book it mm -hmm. try to find a ship in the market for it make money in the margins uh, and uh, so I was doing that before working for operators such as uh, you know operators are like uh, operators owners maybe Western Bulk uh, uh, all the Danes there's so many Danes and um, an old North huge mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but now I work more towards the industrial guys and the traders and, uh, you know, I, okay, my clients, they know shipping. So they, in some cases, know more than me on certain stuff. Uh, still, you know, six years in and I'm still learning new stuff. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, um, I, I would say that, if, you know, it's a mutually beneficial that, you know, they teach me, I teach them and, they try to just get good freight and they are very they are very um interested in good performance from the yeah. owners so even if i have say a, a one ship owner that uh, like a ship owner with one ship uh, that maybe i have never fixed before that is maybe 1 2 dollars cheaper than the other one which they know which they can rely on they go for the more expensive one because they are very interested mm. in having good performance so that's why I say big operators can book cargoes because they are a reliable counterpart, even though they book in a ship that they might not, you know, fully yeah. have a relationship with. They can they can do that and uh, replace it if need be. So because they are not the counterparty to the industrial guys. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, still have a, a lot of uh, relationship to to as for young ship broker to build on um, switching to uh, young people. Uh, what kind of advice can you give to someone who wants to start uh, uh, in sh the shipping ship broking industry? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need any more competition here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Easy. Easy tips. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, uh, the thing is, uh, as I said, uh, it's not a protected title. You don't need to study it, but it, it shows interest. You know, uh, as grades do when you study, they are not, uh, grades are indicative. They aren't determined, they don't determine if you're smart or not. They indicate, you know, perseverance and, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I would say, you know, be aggressive to put your foot in the door. Like, mm. uh, just, if you want to be a ship broker, even if you haven't studied it, if you're, you know, even just a good salesman or whatever, you just knock on the doors of your local ship broking houses on your, if you're on vacation, you know, try to figure out where they are. Just knock on the door, hand your resume and say, I want to work for you. I think I can do a good job. And uh, they will, they will sit at the desk. Uh, well, the lady in the front desk will maybe come and say it, or you just talk to a broker directly and they will, they, will, they will speak about you for weeks. They were like, this guy, this guy. Oh, I like, him. I like the cut of his jib, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, no, I think that's the, I think that's definitely like the, that's the easiest 
a way to well obviously you step out of your comfort comfort zone and put yourself out there but it's uh it's definitely i think the number one tip i got the same tip but you know in the meantime i got to be lucky um so i didn't have to do that but uh i know some people that have done it with great success so that's good yeah good good that. so uh it's the end of the podcast but do you want to add something here maybe or or you'd say everything uh, I think like it's also pretty important that you you know yourself to be a cult, you know a chameleon because you know, there are so many cultural differences. Mm. Uh, so you kind of also need to tread carefully, be respectful, and you know handle your alcohol is also pretty important. But uh, <laughs> uh, and also it's uh, when you get into this stuff, it's it's a lifestyle. You know, it's you can it's a lot of It's a lot of I have fixed chips from vacation. My girlfriend was furious with me for being away from the I was on the beach. I had to step away, find Wi Fi and oh. you know, yeah. Ended up fixing it, but then I on subs on subjects and then I came back from vacation and the vessel delayed. So it didn't so it didn't even so but still, you know, it's uh, you have to you have to be there and do it. Uh you have to do the job, basically. Uh, but uh, and yeah, also there are like hazards because uh, I was actually I was uh, uh, I was uh, I was bidding I was I was looking at an apartment and my realtor calls and he was like ah oh, there is some a lot of interest on this on this uh, on this uh, apartment and I'm like yeah no yeah lasses because that's what uh, in shipping we are very like we we have to be good at poker as well because we show yeah no yeah yeah <laughs> yeah okay sure sure and then and then he calls me and then I call him and yeah so what's the status on the on the apartment oh it's sold what oh you didn't give me last refusal <laughs> and, oh. and then I realized okay you know in the housing market doesn't really work like that so it's uh so you know it's, <laughs> so you have to also separate it's a lifestyle they have to kind of learn to separate it as well. Okay. So, but yeah. Wow. Quite interesting and funny at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, pleasant and funny experiences as well. I, uh, uh, but it was, you know, it was memorable nonetheless. Um, we had a, we had a ship uh, loading in North Brazil, going to the Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, and uh, en route from. Uh, North Brazil. One of the crew members actually died, and I'm speaking to you know the mess that you have to go in as a broker, mm. and you know, and the reason it was a mess because you know the sea leg is huge from North Brazil to to the Gulf, so they had to stick this guy in the freezer. Imagine, imagine this poor cook coming in there every day, staring into his eyes. Jesus. Oh. Yeah, and then they were a month at sea at least, right? And then they come to the Gulf, and they and the discharge port. They said, we don't want them. Well, what are we gonna do with them? We can't accept them because it was it was on the start of Corona as well. So mm. you know they couldn't. Uh, you did, we don't have the infrastructure to have this person ship them and quarantine. It doesn't work like that. So then they had to keep him on board in the freezer, and then they had to secure a cargo going specifically to. Around this area where he was from, I believe it was Southeast Asia. The crew was Southeast Asian, and uh, so he was there on board for a total of like seventy days. And his family was away. It was and it was a you know it's a, it's a logistical mess, you know. Yeah. And you have to step in as well. Obviously, the operations department are they are on top of this kind of stuff, but you also have to you know, have a finger in it as well. And we also had. A, a less pleasant experience as well, where we had a period ship on, it was a long period to one of the huge operators, just head on the local head on, like a Norwegian head on ship. And uh, the ship was discharging off the coast of West Africa. And um, it, the crew actually got kidnapped by pirates. It was, uh, it was when there was, there was more pirate activity on the West coast of Africa. There's basically none mm. now, or there's very little uh, compared to the, You know, East Coast, uh, and uh, the crew was actually kidnapped. So, uh, and you know, we had to involve uh, the American hostage negotiators. The insurance paid ransom. All, everyone got home safe. But you know, this is something we have to be on top on as well, right? Which is yeah. the first time for everything. 
Maybe you've never done it before. I had never done it before. Never seen it, but uh, it was uh, it was something you experienced, you know. And yes, it's, uh, uh, something. Yeah. I, ho- I hope I hope you won't have this experience. Maybe two times. I mean, for the crew, it's not good. Go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They're a bit. They're a bit more. They're a bit more on that kind of stuff now. Like in Nigeria, you have you hire gunboats and uh, mm. and yeah. So it's a bit more. Yeah. It's a bit more okay. on top of it. So this kind of events can have a big impact in uh, the shipping uh, commercial aspect. Imagine, imagine because it creates, of course, uh, for, of course, it's not good for the crew. Secondly, it creates delay on all the stuff behind. Yeah. Yeah, I might. Uh, I can. I can add that uh, that the head owner never calls Nigeria again. Oh, never. yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I imagine the the little area there in the uh, you know along the coast that is Nigeria. This this area yeah. here. Mm mm. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> thank you for your two anecdotes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you, William, for this uh, <laughs> ep- episode. It was very uh, inspiring, very interesting. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, thank you again. And have a really nice uh, afternoon now. <laughs> yeah, you too. Have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening and watching this episode. We are looking forward to bring you more inspiring stories from maritime professionals, experts and students. Do not hesitate to leave a review on Apple Podcast and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Your support means a lot to us and it greatly helps in our continuous growth. We committed to bringing you more exciting episodes with passionate guests. 